Hello, everyone, and welcome back today, Wednesday. I know we were just all together on Monday and uh, talking about influencer campaigns, and we're going to continue that conversation a little bit today as part of this webinar series for PRCG and um, its agency partners. So just a couple things to remind everyone, um, since we are not viewing each other via webcam um, and having kind of a back and forth dialogue, we are happy to answer any questions that you have. Just be sure that you use your chat function there in the uh, GoToMeeting window. And if you will send those as like an instant message, direct message, whatever you want to call it, um, we will make sure to address those questions at the end of the presentation. If you have, if you'll submit your questions as we go, and it's relevant to what we're talking about at that time, uh, we'll go ahead and try to address those at that moment if possible. A um, couple other things is, uh, you know, just a reminder that this is an on, part of an ongoing series of webinars that PRCG will be offering throughout the year. So we invite you to stay tuned for others that will be coming. Um, available for you to attend as part of your membership that is all um, going to be sent to you in your email updates so other agency partners sharing their stories case studies and such as well as keep in mind that this is part two if you will of our talk on influencer campaigns so just to refresh quickly on Monday we talked a lot about the tactical aspects of and research behind planning, implementing uh, these types of campaigns. So today we're going to talk a little bit more on the actual implementation of it and exactly how you can create uh, better reach, better engagement, and um, really get people to talking about your brand, your services, your organization um, as a result of a well-executed influencer campaign that involves a storyline. And so this is part how-to, part advice, and part case study. Uh, it's all a little bit intermingled so that we it all builds on each other. And uh, but like I said, if you have questions, be sure you shoot those questions to us via the online chat feature, and we will do our best to answer those as we go. And if we don't get them answered as we go, we'll for sure address every question at the end. So. We're going to go ahead and get started. If you are joining us and you don't have your own audio on mute, we would encourage you to put it on mute. We are recording these sessions. That way we can um, make these available to watch on demand and have them available to other members whose schedules didn't allow them or permit them to work with us today So, or join us today. Um, of course, it's lunchtime here in New Orleans, so I have to start out by... Uh, by making you hungry because we're going to talk a little bit about steak today. And so what I want you to do is to take a moment and look at these four photos and determine of the four which one you think looks the best. So let's talk a little bit about, about steak and what we look for in qualities of steak. And I promise you this is relevant. So um, I'm going to assume you've looked at all four of these and you've had a moment to take into consideration what you think is the one that you would want to eat. So what I will tell you is if you look at these four, all four of these, I mean, sorry, three of the four are prime cuts of filet. Only one is choice. So what you have are three of these uh, steaks here are the absolute highest quality steak that you can purchase. Um, What's interesting is when you talk about prime steak, it, prime steak is only 3% of the total um, amount of beef produced annually in the United States. So, so it is a little bit rare um, to find that level you know, in your grocery stores or such, but that's why we go to a prime steakhouse is because they specialize in that grade of beef. When you look at these steaks, the upper left-hand steak there is actually from Denny's. The upper right-hand steak um, on the white plate is Ruth's Chris. The one in the lower left-hand corner is um, Outback Steakhouse. And the one in the lower right-hand corner is Morton's. And so the reason why I bring this up is visually we're all drawn to something different. But what's interesting is what looks great we think tastes great. When you're looking at building a successful 
um, PR campaign, when you're looking at building a successful influencer campaign, it's really important that we consider the emotional connection that people have with our brands. Because it's not about just getting them in there once to eat. We want them to become a repeat customer. And, and the point that we want to drive home with this particular photo uh, grouping here is that everyone probably joining us today selected a different steak. But the, 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 the thing that I find most entertaining about this is the one that I find looks the least appetizing because it's a little bit overcooked. Um, it just has steamed vegetables with it down in the lower left-hand corner is the one that I would assume was Denny's. I would never assume that that was actually one of the higher um, grades as far as beef goes, cuts of beef, on this page. So what has happened here is I've made a decision based off of what looks great, what I think would taste great, but I still have it connected with the brand. And so what we want to do is look at how we connect with brands and using influencer cam campaigns to connect our audiences with our brands. But if I told you, if I put these words in front of you, gambler, single mother, horse trainer, chemist, gunshot victim, you start wondering what, what I'm talking about. You have no clue that what I'm talking about is actually um, someone very, very involved with one of the brands we just mentioned. All of these words describe Ruth Fertel, who's the founder of Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. She loved to gamble. She gambled in her restaurants and took the, the earnings from uh, her her card games and put those into the waitress's uh, tip jar. She was a single mother. The whole reason why she purchased a steakhouse um, was because she wanted to be able to put her children through college, her two sons. An interesting thing about Ruth, uh, she graduated college at the age of 19 with a chemistry degree and was a chemist here in New Orleans at one of the universities. And she went home one day realizing she wasn't making enough money, couldn't provide for her children the way she wanted to opens up the newspaper, sees a classified ad that says steakhouse for sale, $18,000, and it had a phone number. She never worked in the restaurant industry, knew nothing about steak. All she knew was she needed to find a way to make extra money. She goes to her banker, asks him to loan uh, her $18,000 in 1965, and, which was a considerable sum then, um, as she took out a mortgage on her home. He said, well, how are you actually going to put food into the, into the refrigerators to search? Because I haven't thought about that yet. He goes, well, maybe we should give you $22,000 instead. So that's how um, she came to buy her first steakhouse. She was always a lady at first. She was the first licensed female racehorse trainer in the state of Louisiana. See here a chemist. She went on to use her chemistry background to develop the broiler, uh, which is still used in Ruth's Chris Steakhouses today, all in 150 locations. She pulled on her chemistry background on how to create a cooking, um, a, a, a broiler that would actually cook the steaks and would caramelize the salt on the outside. And then she also survived um, a robbery in which she was shot and her purse was actually taken, but she survived. She was about five foot tall, weighed hardly anything, just a little scrappy, scrappy lady. We'll show you here some photos of her. She smoked cigars, drank bourbon, gambled, and was a larger-than-life character. And the reason why we're going through this process is to show you that as we develop a personality for our brand, as we start talking about how that brand formed, we begin to differentiate ourselves from Outback Steakhouse. We begin to differentiate ourselves from Morton's. Most companies are just started for profit. But when you really start looking inside the box and looking to see what it is that makes that brand or that organization special, those are the things that we need to capture in an influencer campaign. Those are the things that are like gold. The first influencer campaign we ever did for Ruth's Chris, we actually never talked about food. We did not talk about anything on the menu, anything that you could walk in and eat today. We talked about the brand heritage. We talked about Ruth Purnell as a I'm sorry, Ruth Fertel is a female entrepreneur, and we talked about where the brand was heading uh, for the next 50 years, but we didn't even discuss food, do any sort of promotions. So why did we do this influencer campaign for Ruth's Chris? And that was because they came to us and actually asked us this question, how do we bridge a generational gap? We noticed that there was a multi-generational family unit dining at Ruth's Chris. It's a tradition with an older demographic, we see them starting to pass that tradition down to younger generations, 
but they specifically realized that they weren't connecting with millennials. And they wanted to do an influencer campaign that would reach out to millennials and basically show them that the tradition at dining, of dining at Ruth's Chris is just as alive and well as it was 50 years ago when the brand was founded. And we wanted to show them how we have evolved as a brand and how Ruth Patel set the standard for first class hospitality and um, in, in the fine dining category and how we, we can deliver that experience to them that experience that millennials are looking for. So we knew that authenticity had to be, at, it was just paramount. We knew that we had to do an authentic campaign, share our authentic story, and really expose the brand for who we are and what we stand for. Here's a quote um, that a millennial listener um, who was listening to NPR, and I love this, entertain me, make me happy, capture my attention, speak to my conscious, and then leave me the heck alone. Because that's exactly how influencer campaigns really succeed. You have to entertain people. You have to make them happy. You capture their attention, and when you speak to their conscience, they begin forming an emotional connection with you that results in a long-lasting relationship. We knew that the most authentic thing we had to share with millennials was the story of our past, present, and future. So we knew that when we started developing this campaign for Ruth's Chris, we had to have elements of our past, present, and future. We knew that we had to look inside the box. I tease people all the time that this is a photo of me as a child because this is about how I, how I grew up. I never played with toys. I was always kind of the, the, person, the kid by myself um, looking in a box. I'd play with a cardboard box for would anything, but I think that helped me learn how to look in introspectively to a brand and figure out what it is their personality is. We didn't want to think outside the box. We didn't want to change people's perceptions, we wanted to show them how we could deliver today for what they were expecting. Um, as with any campaign, research is important. So we did a quick just secondary type of you know Google search, um, looked at some research that was already out there that other people had commissioned as primary research. And on the left hand side you'll see a column of what millennials expected from ma major food and restaurant corporations. On the right-hand side, those bullet points show exactly what we had, that Ruth's Chris, how they could deliver and meet those expectations. So for instance, it's a place to chill at. We knew that our larger bar footprint, which we're putting in at all of our locations, was important because it allowed people to just kind of hang out, to be more communal, to meet in larger groups without being in a formal uh, main dining room at one of our restaurants. Denny's has been doing a similar thing called the Den, which where they put, um, they've actually been began putting couches and it looks like a living room and the service teams will actually come serve you, take your order and they'll just bring it back to you at your couch and, um, and that's where you eat. We knew that millennials liked customizable dishes, so we, we decided to do scalable and customizable. So a couple things here. We wanted to be able to meet the price point of millennials and, and they feel like they could come have a genuine experience at Ruth's Chris. So perhaps they order a smaller portion of our spicy lobster versus the normal portion. They get to have that same, that same food, that same experience. Customizable dishes. One of our um, most iconic dishes, of course, is our New Orleans bread pudding. But it always just came with the rum sauce. Now you get to customize that dish. We have four spirited sauces. There's a Grand Marnier, there's a, there's a rum, there's a, um, I, I don't know what all the different ones are, but there's actually four and you can select and customize the taste of that dessert. It's almost like doing a wine pairing. Now you can pick, compare your dessert with the, with the entree and the other uh, things that you've had while you're dining there. For our artisanal options, we actually added reserve cuts. So that was a bone-in filet. That was our new, um, our new tomahawk ribeye. Small plates, they like shareable things that, they, that can stimulate a discussion. So one of the most successful things that Ruth's Chris has ever done as a brand was add happy hour, which they call sizzle, swizzle, swirl. And it offers $9 entrees um, and portions, smaller portions of all of some of our most famous and iconic dishes that you can have at a much lower price. Um, Angus beef, we have it, we serve sizzling steaks, and of course, 
millennials love selfies, they love taking braggies to show where they're at, where they're having that experience. So we started a hashtag campaign, this is how it's done, which is Ruth's Chris motto. And so what you'll see here, we made a list of the expectations millennials um, have, and we made that list based on our research, and we began looking at how we could deliver on that. And that's going to become really important here in a moment when you see how we initiated storytelling and uh, techniques to elevate the success of this campaign. So why do we tell stories? Why would we want to tell a story? What is the reasoning behind that? Stories have a deep affecting feel of an experience. So when we looked at those photos of steaks earlier and we talked about how three of the four were all prime cuts of beef, more than likely, I would say probably a 90% chance, three, all three of those prime cuts of beef came from the same exact packing plant. What's interesting about that is how we plated it, how it was cooked, how it was presented, how it was photographed, made each one look distinctly different. Therefore, we connected with a different one based on visual appeal. How we talk about the feel of our brand allows people to make an emotional connection. You'll find brands that are edgy and modern and unique. You'll find some that are traditional, uh, rooted in and values. And so what you have to do is you have to look inside the box like we talked earlier to figure out what is that experience, what are those components of the story that really will have create a deep affecting feel. Storytelling isn't just about emotional connections. It really does stimulate different parts of the brain and causes um, a coupling, if you will. And of all the things on this slide, the thing that we really need to focus on is neural coupling. And the reason why that's important is whatever I tell you as a story, if I tell you a story about my family history, you actually turn that, you will actually mirror that story exactly. After you mirror that story, you begin turning that into your own ideas and experiences. It's a process they call neural coupling. So you figure out we have similar brain activity and how we're speaking, but then you began to turn that story and relate it to you. I am um, told the story of Ruth Fratell during a storytelling workshop one time um, in Alabama, I'm sorry, in Mississippi. And what was interesting about it was there was a lady in the back row who began crying as I was talking about the story. I couldn't figure out why, and so at the break she came up to me and she said, I've never been to a Ruth's Chris. She said, however, I, will be, I, I am leaving early today from the workshop. I hope you're not offended because I am going to the local Ruth's Chris. There was one in that city, and I'm going to be eating there. She goes, her story is so similar to mine about being a single mother, about taking a risk, because that's how I ended up in public relations from a job that was completely unrelated. About two weeks later, I received an email from her, and she said that she's already been back three or four times. But it shows there that storytelling, the story of Ruth Fertel resonated with her. And, and you'll see why here in a moment that that connection was made beyond just the scientific part of it, beyond the fact that she was just a single mother, because there are other levels of the Ruth's Chris story that allowed her to connect with the brand. But it's such a simple story, and if told in a simple way, full of personality, you want to show evolution. And I think evolution is really the main thing. Because if you look at the standard story structure, we're all taught to write stories with a beginning, a middle, and an end. However, we're talking about engaging audiences. We're talking about creating emotional connections with potential customers. We don't want that to end. So what's interesting is you hear storytelling. You hear about writing a story. You hear about telling a story. And we go back to these um, these uh, storytelling methods, these structures, if you will, that we learned all through school, which is beginning and middle and end. But what we really need to do is talk about a problem, a solution, and a success. And if I had my, my way about this, I could take success and I would bump that up towards the word model there, and we would actually have something that looked like a progression line, you know, a chart, um, if you will, a graph that was um, kind of moving up because you never want to end a story in a storytelling campaign. You always want to leave growth. You always want to leave room for success. But if you look at the three-step model and how we applied it to the Ruth's Chris campaign, 
The problem began with Ruth's, Ruth Bertel not being able to support her family. She wanted to be able to put her children through college, her sons. The solution was purchasing a steakhouse, which she'd never done before. Her success came in the way uh, she was the first person to ever franchise um, a fine dining establishment. She's the one who invented that business model. Um, and many other firsts, and she's now one of the largest, uh, created one of the largest fine dining uh, franchise brands in the world um, with over 150 locations. So it started out with a problem, she found a solution, and we now focus our campaigns on telling, telling the success and showing where the brand is heading. So as you're planning storytelling um, aspects of an influencer campaign, keep in mind, it's not beginning, middle, end. It is problem solution with a major focus on success. Also, your story is not about your company. It's about the problem. We didn't talk about Chris Steakhouse. We didn't talk about Ruth's Chris as a restaurant. We talked about Ruth Fertel. We talked about her personal struggle. We talked about what it was that she wanted to do. She had a problem, and she went and found a solution for it. So as you're looking at where to begin your narrative for an um, influencer campaign, think about what the problem is that your brand solves. The problem doesn't have to even be, I get a lot of times when we do this talk, people say, well, we don't have a Ruth Bertel. We don't have that story of how we were founded. You know, we're a credit union. Well, what is it that, and so if you're a credit union and you're trying to reach millennials, what is a problem that millennials face? The problem doesn't even have to be your problem. The problem can be the problem of your audience, and the problem can be something that you help them solve. And when you figure out what that solution is, that solution needs to be unique to you. So if you have 10 credit unions that all are trying to solve the same problem, how do you uniquely offer a solution to that problem that certain audiences will latch onto and connect with? That is really what storytelling is all about. Also, your story should answer why you exist. In the case of Ruth Fertel, we know why, why they existed in the beginning. We know what her problem was. But she continued the brand, and the reason why Ruth's Chris is still around 50 years later, which is unheard of for a national restaurant chain, is because she redefined the standard of hospitality. She figured out a way to deliver that same quality of experience time and time again without wavering on any level of, of um, standards, if you will. And no matter where you are, whether it's Dubai, Singapore, Portland, Dallas, um, or Orlando, you will get the same experience from one Ruth's Chris to the next. And she exists because she absolutely loved what she did. She absolutely loved making people happy. And she absolutely wanted to serve the finest steak that you could find and couple that and differentiate her brand by offering the highest level of hospitality you could expect. She also existed, as we talked about with her problem, because she needed a way to provide for her family. But another thing that's interesting is Ruth Fertel only hired single mothers to wait tables at a time in New Orleans where only men waited tables. But she, she related with, with the single mothers. She knew they would show up. She knew they would be on time. She knew they would work hard because they depended on their job just like she did to support their families and their children. And so she had different reasons for why the brand existed. So we actually had the ability, I guess if you should say, or the fortune, good fortune, to have many reasons why the brand existed, many great stories. It may be a little bit more difficult for you with some of your clients to answer these questions, to find these answers, but they're there. If you look introspectively and you dig hard enough, they're there. This is a great exercise when you're trying to find the solution. So we talked about you have a problem, you start with your problem, that defines where your story starts, but the solution is that middle part. So what you don't want to do, and I talked about how with Ruth's Chris, we did not talk about the food. We did not talk about the menu. We did not go through a lot of detail in our influencer campaign. We talked about Ruth and the inspiration behind the brand and where the name Ruth's Chris eventually came from. Um, it happened because of a fire and a move of the original restaurant, which we won't get into today due to time. Uh, we talked about those things. But 
what you have to do is you have to find that solution. So this is a quick exercise that I use myself when I'm trying to think my way through planning a campaign is don't sell me blank, sell me blank. So a great example to use here is Volvo. Don't sell me a Volvo, sell me safety. That's what they're known for. If you think about different brands and what they're known for, you want to sell the glamorous aspect of it. So with Ruth's Chris, we're not selling you steak. We're selling you an experience to create a memory on a 500-degree sizzling plate that you can't have at any other restaurant anywhere in the world. That's what we're selling. That was our solution. When If our problem was to deliver the highest quality dining experience available to our guests, we knew we had to make it unique. So we don't sell steak because there's a lot of prime steakhouses in the world that sell the same exact steaks that we do, seasoned the same, prepared very closely the same. We sell an experience, and that is the opportunity to create a memory on a 500-degree sizzling plate. So as you're looking and identifying your problem, you could use as the basis of your story, and you begin thinking about what the solution to those problems are, dig a little bit deeper. Don't just settle on the highest level thing that you can think of. When you start identifying success, you have to identify what makes your organization different. So, for instance, we talked about credit unions. You identify your problem, you understand what it is the solution is because you're selling a unique set of services or a unique set of um, financial planning services, let's just say, that no other credit union is offering but that, will, that millennials will respond to. But what makes you different? Why is that different? Maybe it's because you have a millennial um, who's a certified financial planner that helped develop that, that leads your financial planning division. Whatever the case may be, think about what makes you different. One of the things for Ruth and Chris was we also have the option of um, differentiating ourselves because of our strong heritage and tie to New Orleans where the brand was founded. So you can walk into any prime steakhouse and you can get Brussels sprouts, you can get mashed potatoes, um, you can get all those types of things, but what you're not going to get are the New Orleans barbecue shrimp. You're not going to find sweet potato casserole and bread pudding, those unique um, New Orleans cocktails such as a hurricane or a, um, you know, a French 75 or whatever the case may be. You're not going to find those types of experiences at other steakhouses. That's what makes us different and able to offer the, the level of hospitality we, we do to our guests. So as you're looking through and you identify your solution, your success is going to become what makes you different. When I talked about leaving that portion of your story open, that's because you need to be able to tell them how you're different and how you're going to continue to be different and the changes you're going to make. You don't want to end that narrative with, here's, here's why we began, here, the problem, here is our solution, here's how we succeeded, we're done. You want to leave that conversation open so you can continue to add to that story and continue to deliver um, more content and build on that as a platform, as a foundation for your influencer campaign. You also want to create characters that people care about. And when we say create characters, we don't mean go out and make up a fictional character that you're going to talk about. Look inside. We found that with Ruth's Chris, that became the Broads from Broad Street. So you'll you'll probably wonder, and hopefully none of you are offended by the title of the presentation, which is um, "Good Broads Tell Great Stories." And the reason why is Ruth hired this group of single mothers, and they became they actually named themselves affectionately the Broads from Broad Street because the original location was on Broad Street. To this day, there are still probably five to seven of the broads that work at Ruth's Chris. Um, they're in their mid-60s. They're going to retire. They've, most of them have never done anything except work as a service team member at Ruth's Chris. They are characters. As they're waiting on you, they're telling you stories about Miss Ruth and how she trained them and, and about the restaurant's history. Here's one of the most well-known, Lainey. And this is an actual photo from an influencer uh, visit that we hosted at the New Orleans restaurant. It's an influencer, uh, a global food and travel influencer based out of Washington, D.C. He flew in to have dinner at the Roots Chris here just so Lainey could wait on him. 
um, after about 30 minutes, it became apparent that he and Lainey made a great, um, great uh, connection. She ended up throwing her um, her order book to the side, sat down, pulled up a chair, had dinner with him. And right here, um, this moment that he captured was a really incredible moment that ended up defining one of his entire blog posts and social media campaigns. Um, it's hard to kind of tell with the glare here, but she was just had just started kind of tearing up. Because he had asked her, he said, um, he said, what happened? He said, how did you learn how to deal with difficult guests? And, and that question triggered a memory of uh, Ruth Bertel, who was great friends with Lainey. And she said, I remember one night I was having a horrible night. And she said, I went into the kitchen and I started crying because my, my guests were just, I, I couldn't please them. And she goes, the guests were fine. They weren't being, you know, hard to deal with. But I was just struggling. And um, she said, Ruth just came over and, and, and patted me on the back. And she said, Lainey, you have four tables out there. And those four tables are your living room. She goes, you've invited those guests into your home. Now, all you have to do is go out there and treat those guests as if they were at your home and you were feeding them this evening. She goes, I can't offer you a solution. I can't train you on how to be a better service team member. All I can do is she said, those guests are our family, and you need to go act as if that's your own living room or your own dining room and treat those guests just like that. And Lainey went on, that was the foundation of most of the training procedures for the broads, and she, um, she had such an emotional connection to that story that that was the scenario, if you will, that this influencer used to tell the story about the legendary hospitality for Ruth's Chris, how simple the formula behind it is, how simple the training is behind it. And to this day, that is still what guides their training process and the backbone, the foundation, if you will, of their training process to train service team members for 100, well, right at 150 locations uh, globally. As you're telling the story, you have to stay very consistent with your brand promise. So if you're starting to tell a story, and here our differenti differentiating factor was our legendary hospitality, we have to continue to deliver on that brand promise, but we also have to stay consistent with that in our storytelling. We can't one day say that we're, we're great at delivering a quality experience and a high level of hospitality, and then the next day change our narrative to talk about the quality of our beef. We have to figure out what makes us different. We have to figure out what that solution is and what that success story is, and we have to stay consistent with that as we move through these campaigns. So why did this work, this case study that we're sharing with you on Ruth's Chris? It worked because we showed guests why we were different. We didn't tell them. We showed them. We had stories. We researched. We found ways to help millennials connect with how Lainey, who's in her mid-60s, abroad from Broad Street, could deliver the experience that they are looking for in a fine dining uh, restaurant. Harkening back to earlier in the, um, the presentation where we showed the list, of half of it was what millennials expected from a restaurant, half of it was how we could deliver on that. We use those to guide and show examples of how even a brand that is associated with an older demographic deliver those through the eyes of Lainey, through stories that she could tell about Ruth and how Ruth, if she were here today, she would be making sure that those people were just as welcome in her living room, just as welcome at her dining room table as they were 50 years ago. This is a visual report, if you will, that we did. So this campaign we did for Ruth's Chris uh, lasted 90 days. At the end of 90 days, we already had an audience of 4 million and growing. Now that's not 4 million potential impressions. That's not 4 million, you know, it reached out to 4 million. That's 4 million people actually engaged with the stories, left a comment, shared something, liked something, actually somehow engaged with the story. The quotes here you'll see, uh, thanks for the memories, love Lainey and all the wonderful old memories, great meals on North Broad in both places, Ruth always smoking a cigarette and holding a court, Shirley told the best jokes in town. That was a comment left, a blog post about the heritage behind um, 
the brand and how it came to be. What an inspiring story. Um, I will tell you, we engaged three influencers, each for 30 days. So the first one told the brand heritage story. The second one talked about Ruth as a female entrepreneur. She herself is a female entrepreneur in the hospitality industry. So that's where this uh, comment came from. And the final one uh, dined at Ruth's Chris, and she is all about recipes. So we were getting ready to launch a new menu, and we allowed her to be one of the be the first to publicly launch um, a new public recipe from Ruth's Chris, and then she talked about the brand heritage and some things as well. But you know, I let my favorite one as a comment. Andy left here. I should not have read this first thing in the morning. Just like you get a song stuck in your head, I have these images stuck in my stomach. Yum. So as you can see, the comments that were left created meaningful connections with the brand. These are connections that could not have been made if all we did was visually show them photos of the stakes like we did on the very first slide. So that kind of gives you an overview of how we took modern day storytelling tactics developed that into our, uh, and included that, rolled that, if you will, into uh, a strategy for an influencer campaign for Roots Chris, and the results that we generated, because normally on something like this, you may be looking really great um, if you see an audience of around one million or so. This audience number is still growing. Um, that four million that we show there in the lower left-hand corner was as a result of our 90 days of engagement. Um, this content is out there. It lives on. It's wonderful in the event of, say, a brand incident. Perhaps, um, who knows what the case may be, but these are things that we can repost, uh, reshare, and, and allow this content to reemerge in our social media channels. Uh, we can use this as content on the website that we link out to. All this content lives on these influencers' blogs and allows us to keep kind of growing our audience, um, if you will. So as we finish up here, um, what I want to do is, um, if we have any questions, address those questions at this time. I don't know that we have any, but we'll give you just a few seconds right now if you have any questions on a little bit more um, detail. Be happy to answer in detail kind of how some of the things came about. As you know, you can always reach out to us via um, email. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, we also will be posting the recorded version of these um, seminars or presentations, if you will, to YouTube. I think the first one is going up today, the one from Monday. So if you weren't able to join us on Monday, you can go back and watch that. Uh, this one will probably be up by middle of next week at the latest. And so we encourage you to share these with your internal team, share these with your clients. And, um, and reach out to us if you have questions. We're here to help you, um, you know, as one of our PRCG partners. And um, it's that collaboration and partnership that makes us all stronger. So thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your attention and uh, participation. And if there's anything that we can do, uh, just let us know. We look forward to joining you um, on the next one, which will be coming through your email and as far as the topic, the speaker, and date and time. Thank you so much. Have a great day.